So we're back. We're going to resume. So I'm going to spend, just want to spend about, this is about 10 minutes, quick walkthrough. Um, these guys, I'm going to show you their website. These guys, Code School, do a really good job. They have a few online courses. In fact, they have a JavaScript primer that I'm going to suggest you work through. It's free that um, before next week. This is just kind of 11 minutes. They've got a really good introduction to Node, how it works. And they show you a little bit of sample code. So you can enjoy their little jingle at the beginning, which I think is kind of hilarious. And we'll just get this by way of introduction. <coughs> Just as fast as a snail, we need invented programming starting from the top. Better write some code so the world doesn't stop. Like yeah. With the non-blocking models, we will be just fine. Build some Google Chrome's V8 runtime. And all you need to do is write some JavaScript code and use the real-time web window. Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching Real Time Web with Node.js. In this level, we're going to give you a quick introduction to Node, talk about what it is, what it isn't, blocking, non blocking, what invented programming is, and then finally, what that event loop is that you've heard about with Node. So let's jump into it. Node.js allows you to build scalable network applications using JavaScript on server side. Underneath the covers of Node, you're going to find the V8 JavaScript runtime. This is the same runtime that is used in your Chrome browser on your client side. What Node does is provides a wrapper around this engine, providing additional functionality for building network applications. It's really fast. Why is it fast? Well, if you look under the covers of Node and this runtime, you find it's all written in C, which obviously is very fast. So what can you build with Node? Well, here's a couple of examples. You could build a WebSocket server. So a good example of this is maybe a chat server where you have your browsers, lots of browsers connecting to the server, and there's chat going on, and you're sending messages back and forth between the client and the server, and the socket stays open. You can also do a file upload client. So when you think about uploading big, large files, you want to be able to do it in a way that's not blocking. So you can do more than one file at a time, and maybe even start processing the file as you get the first few pieces of it. Also, you could create an ad server. When you think about ads that get served on web pages all over the net, they need to be really fast. These are you know, maybe images that are appearing on other people's websites, and they need to be able to be rapid and quick across the network. Um, also, any real-time data apps. So not just you know, from on the internet, not just from your browser to your server, but any sort of network servers, maybe even local network servers, would be a good fit for Node.js. Node.js is not a web framework. It's not going to replace Rails. It's not going to replace Django. It's very low-level network communication we're talking about here. There are libraries that people have written that sit on top of Node to be a web framework. Um, but Node at its most basic level is not that. Node is also not for beginners, because we are talking about network communication. Node is also not a multi-threaded application. When we write our applications with Node, we write them as if we're dealing with a single-threaded server. Before we get into some actual node code, we need to make sure everybody knows the difference between blocking code and non-blocking code. Here's some pseudocode to print some file contents. First, we want to read the file from the file system, set it equal to the contents variable, print the contents variable, and then do something else. So if we think about how this code executes, first, we read from the file system, we can't actually print out the contents until we've read out all the contents from the file. So it's kind of blocking here. And then, obviously, we can do something else. What would a non-blocking version of this code look like? Well, we might read the file from the file system. Whenever we're complete with that, print out the contents from the file. And then, finally, do something else. That technique there, saying, when you're complete, do this, we call a callback. We're going to call back that function once the file is done reading. Executing the pseudocode might go like this, where we read the file from the file system. We might do something else, so it's simply going to continue on, and then at any point in time in the future when it's done reading the file, it's going to print the contents. 
Well, here's some actual node code. First of all, the blocking version of reading out the file might look like this, where we're getting all the contents of the file, we're then logging that out, and then doing something else. So obviously when this gets executed, it just runs one at a time. The non-blocking version of this in node is going to call a read file. And look at this. We're actually sending in a function as the second parameter to read file. That's our callback. And when we get the contents, log the contents. And then we can say doing something else. So when we execute this, as we mentioned, it's going to start reading the file. It's then going to continue execution. And when it's done reading the file, it's going to print out the contents at some point in the future. Will it have Hopefully this JavaScript syntax looks familiar. And there's a Sorry? If it was, say, it's doing something else and it skipped what it's doing, um, and it's going through 10 things, if it said the eighth thing and then the file finishes reading, will it have to stop what it's doing to go uh, log the contents, or would it continue that and log this? It continues. So in the first example, let's say there's a million lines in that file. Okay. The output we're going to get with the blocking code is first we're going to get all one all million lines, and then at the end we're going to get it printing doing something else. In the non-blocking <coughs> version, the first thing that's going to get output is this line doing something else, and then when this is done, then the contents of the file will get printed after. Okay. So it do no, it doesn't stop is the short answer. Okay. So these would output the same thing but in different order. So it can still only do one thing at a time, but it can remember to go where it needs to go back to. Uh, no, it can do multiple things at a time. It's doing these simultaneously. As it's writing this out, this process doesn't pause. Okay. This is still happening. The file's still being read, but this is going to output first because that process is faster. We'll actually try a simple example like this, either the end of class next week or the start of week three, where we'll write the same code, we'll kind of read from two text files, and we'll try writing a blocking version, and we'll try writing a non-blocking version, and we'll see that the thing, the output we get is different depending on whether we're using the blocking or the non-blocking. Write this, which would be just fine. We could declare the function and set that equal to a variable, and then when we call read file, we could send that function into read file. Either syntax would work just fine to do the same thing. Let's take a closer look at this code, and let's see what happens when we're reading two files at the same time. First of all, if we had to do this in a blocking way, we look at the timeline. If this was blocking, we would read one file and then the next file. However, since our code is non-blocking, if we read two files at the same time, they're going to read in parallel and happen much quicker. Now it's time for our Node.js hello world, or in our case, let's do a hello doc. So our first line in this file, we need to require the HTTP module. So we're including another library. This is how we include libraries typically in Node. We're going to call the create server function. That function takes as its single parameter a callback with request and response. We're then going to write a 200 status code in the header for the response. We're going to write out the response body. And then finally, we're going to end the response in action. We want our server to listen on port 8080. And then to ensure our server is running, we're simply going to log out listening on port 8080. We run the server on our command line. We're going to see that it prints out listening on port 8080. And then if we use the curl command line tool to hit the server, it's going to return to us, hello, this is dog. We could also just call up our browser and go to that port, and we would get the same result. Now let's talk a little bit about how Node executes this code. The first time we go through this code and execute it, Node is going to register events. In this case, we're registering the request event for whenever a request comes in. Once it gets done executing the script, Node goes into something called an event loop. It's checking for events continuously. Did a request come in? Did a request come in? Did a request come in? As soon as a request comes in, it's going to trigger that event, and it's going to run the callback that we wrote and print our hello, this is Doc. Now you might be wondering, why are we writing JavaScript? Well, the creator of Node, Ryan Dahl, wrote this really good quote, which kind of explains why. I'll let you read it. So JavaScript makes it really easy for us to program in an invented way, to do 
evented programming using that event loop and write code that is potentially non-blocking. When we run a node application, like we said, it registers a bunch of events like request, connection, or close. And those events sometimes even trigger even more events. And then we have this event loop, which is constantly looking for events. And once our application gets into that event loop, it can start triggering and emitting events into what we might call our event queue. So if a request event comes in at the same time as a close event, well, events are going to be processed one at a time on our event loop. Let's make our hello world code a little bit more complex and simulate a long running process. So here we're creating our server. We write the status code back to the response. We write dog is running. Now we're going to do a timeout. We're going to pause for about five seconds to simulate a long running process. Once that timeout is done, we're going to write out dog is done to the response and end the response. We're going to pause for 500 milliseconds, which is basically five seconds, and listen on port DDD. You might notice here there are two different events in our code. We have the request event, which we should be familiar with from earlier, and we also have a timeout event. So every time a request comes in, it's going to create a new event, a timeout event, which will then be called back in five seconds. We're going to send in two requests to our Hello World server with the timeout and see what happens. So our first request comes in, triggers that request event, the request callback executes, that set timeout code registers and it's going to wait five seconds. Meanwhile, another request comes in, triggers that request event again, the callback executes, the set timeout registers, and now this has to wait five seconds. Then when our first timeout is done, it's going to trigger that set timeout event, which will trigger the set timeout callback, and it returns that response. Then our second request is going to trigger the event, and do the callback, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, two requests can happen at the same time and nothing is blocking. What would this look like, though, if that set timeout was blocking? Well, let's try it. So a request comes in, the request callback executes, and the set timeout locks the world, right? It stops the world, and nothing else can execute on this process while we are on a timeout. It is officially blocked. So if a request tries to come in, well, it just has to wait for the server to get unlocked. Once it is unblocked, it'll trigger the set timeout event, and so on and so forth, and the second request gets to lock the server again. Obviously, blocking is bad. And you might be wondering, why would anybody write a programming language or a framework that blocks and stops the world? Well, you find this in a lot of programming languages. Often when you do a call out to web services, it'll block. When you're doing a read or write to the database, it'll block or when you're calling out to a C extension, it will block. And this is one of the reasons why people love Node.js. Because from the very start with Node, its purpose was to be completely non-blocking, and all of the libraries that you'll find for Node are all non-blocking. That's pretty cool. Well, we reached the end of level one. It's time to get your hands dirty in the challenges. We'll see you at level two. So that's just a bit of a snapshot of kind of where we're going, what Node looks like. You see how we could start the command from the command line, and then we can also run it in our browser. So there's no HTML whatsoever, purely just a JavaScript file in this case. Okay. Um, now, he mentions Ryan Dahl, who is the creator. So Ryan Dahl was a developer at Google. So in 2008, he came out. He'd been working on this idea. And actually, his original presentation, where he first launched Node.js to the world, is actually on YouTube. The video is, I think, between an hour, oops, between an hour and an hour and a half. It's not very good quality, but it's quite interesting. Where he sort of talks about how he came up with the idea and the background for where Node Node comes from. Okay. So these guys have a bunch of other videos. I'm also going to show you. Here's their site, Code School. They have some free online courses. And I've put the link up now in tools and resources. What I'm going to recommend you do before next week, actually, I've put it, sorry, I've put it in the lesson two folder, is a link. So Code School has 
If you go to codeschool.com and click on JavaScript, they have one free online JavaScript lesson. So it's similar in style to the video. They've got that guy Greg talking, they've got some code examples and some things you do online to do some basic JavaScript. So I'm highly gonna recommend you go through the free course before next week. Okay, it's gonna make your time in class worth it. They have other paid courses. Um, they've got a jQuery one. They do have, there is an intro to Node that's free also, their first Node.js lesson. pretty sure in here the first one with node is free and actually one of your labs later on that you'll do with Tom I think it's lab three is going through their first angular this one shaping up with angular so this is free and basically we're gonna have you do this online course as a lab so you'll go through it um, so there's some really neat things in here. So these ones are all, all free. There's quite a lot here. Okay, so some of the videos on YouTube are good. And please have a look at that JavaScript primer. And you might want to walk, I highly recommend you walk through that for next week. Anybody have any questions about any pieces of the video that give you some sense of blocking and non-blocking? We'll play around with that more next week. Um, so I want to look a bit more at the mean stack. I'm not going to go through all of this, but we want to look at sort of how the pieces fit together. So those are our four technologies. I'm not going to bother reading this stuff to you. The link to this is on Blackboard, so you can go through. You have access to these notes at any time, whenever you want. So the big strength of this really is that it's JavaScript all the way through. We're not knitting together a whole bunch of different technologies. We're using one language from the front end to the back end to the database. So we're using this MVC or what's known as three-tier architecture where we're splitting up our data from our presentation with our logic layer sitting in the middle, which is what our MVC pattern is designed to do. So we've got definitions here of model view and controller. And here's another diagram. So I put that other diagram I showed you earlier, that's on Blackboard. Here's another view of it. So for example, let's say we're looking at a list of students. So we're looking at a page, it queries the database, uses our model, it runs a get, and we've got a view showing a list. Let's say we've got 10 students on there. Yet at the same time, an 11th student is registering. So they're going to a sign up page and they're registering. And when they hit submit, our controller then adds that user through the model to the database. One of the nice things is the model can then automatically update the view. So if D is being added, and it's Brad, right? Yeah. And Brad's looking at that view. As soon as D's new record gets added into the model, Brad's page can be refreshed. That data can be refreshed without him having to do anything. He can be seeing that data in real time. That's part of what we use Angular for, for doing the dynamic front end. So we also don't have to really worry about serialization and deserialization. Anybody know what those terms mean? Obviously, they're opposites. <laughs> what does serializing or deserializing mean? Kenzie? It's a term that comes from loop where it refers to taking an object and um, reducing it to a really storable form. Yeah. So, for example, if we're going to exchange data, let's say we build a C -sharp application and we're going to take data in from somewhere else and they're going to send it to us in XML. We're going to have to serialize that data, translate it from XML into C Sharp so that we can parse it, interpret it. And then we might have to convert it to XML in order to save it, convert it to SQL values to save it to a database. Well, with the mean stack, everything's JavaScript. So we don't have the data in different formats. It's all JavaScript all the way through. 
So we get a big performance boost and we have to write a lot less code this way. Has anybody worked with JSON before? A little bit? So JSON is the modern format now for exchanging information between applications. So all of our data in a mean stack application is already in JSON format. So it's readable, it's lightweight, it's fast, which means sending data through JSON uses less bandwidth, keeps our hosting costs down. And one of the great things about MongoDB is our data is actually stored in JSON. We don't have to store it in a different way. So what does a JSON look like? Something as simple as that. So actually what Mongo uses is a format of JSON called Bison. Basically it's JSON converted to binary, ones and zeros. So to send data in or pull data out using Node.js and Mongo is great because it's all JavaScript. We're using JavaScript to connect and write our queries, but the data we get back is in that same JavaScript format. So it's very readable if we need to look at the data. It's fast, lightweight. We can also have nested data. So if we have one-to-many relationships, let's say a user had, for example, a series of pictures. We could have a nested collection with picture one, picture two, picture three, unlimited. This is all those, also the standard for API development. So we want to build an API so another application can send data to us or can pull data out of our application. JSON is the format that all APIs use. So here's how the pieces kind of fit together. We're using MongoDB as our storage and no relational NoSQL database. We're using Node to do all of the parsing. We're using the Express middleware to build our server and talk between the database and our application. And then we're using Angular on the front end to create a rich data-driven front end where we can do updates in real time or do partial page updates. So I'm not going to go through all of this, just a couple of points I want to highlight. So we've talked about these things already. Basically this came out once Google, once Google came out with Chrome and the new, the new V8 engine in 2008. So it's that same JavaScript interpreter that's used by Node. And it is compiled down to native machine code. So again, it's built for speed. It's going to run fast, much faster than interpreted script like PHP. It's event driven. He talked about that. We've talked about asynchronous code and the benefits of that. Um, Node is very lightweight in that it doesn't come with much. We're hand coding. You know, we've got a text editor like brackets and we're hand coding stuff. What Node does come with is a utility called Package Manager. Anybody ever built a WordPress site before? Use WordPress? Okay. If you wanted to add something to your WordPress, so let's say you had a WordPress site and you wanted to add something, like, let's say an event calendar. How would you do it? Yeah, you would go to the plugins and you'd search event calendar and there's all kinds of pre-built calendars you can sort through and you can just plug one in, that functionality is already built. Same with Node Package Manager. So Node is open source, so many developers, maybe some developer has built an authentication component. Well, we're not going to waste time writing our own authentication unless we need something really custom. We're going to use Package Manager to search, and we can just plug in that functionality. When you do ASP.NET with Tom next summer, ASP.NET has similar functionality. They call theirs NuGet Package Manager. So rather than writing all the code libraries ourselves, all kinds of third-party modules we can browse, download, and install. Right? And it's as simple from the command line as typing npm install and the name of your package, bang. It creates a folder, if it doesn't already there, called node modules, and any third-party packages we add to an application get added there. So we can install one, any package. We can save that install if we want it to be global. We can uninstall or update packages with these simple commands. So we'll be using NPM basically, we may not use it the first class we do Node, but probably every class after we will be. And basically what this creates, our Node applications have a site configuration file. We don't have these in PHP, 
The few of you who have done ASP.NET already, it's similar to a web.config file. It's basically a JSON file, and Node gives us a wizard at the command prompt to build one of these out for us. I'll show you what it looks like. So this package.json file, by default it has a name, a version, and an author. It also lists any dependencies or packages we're adding in. So if we were using a package for Google authentication, that'll get listed in the package.json. So here's what it would look like at its kind of a minimum if we only had a couple packages. So the name of our application, we can give it a version. And if we added Express and Grunt, Tom might get into Grunt with you guys a bit, they'd be in here. So we can build these ourselves, but there's also a command line tool. If we type this command, npm in it, basically package manager will give us a bunch of prompts. It'll ask us a bunch of questions. And a little, it's a little hard to see here. So what's the name of your application? What's the version? Are you sure this is right? And then it just generates the site configuration JSON file for us. We can create it manually. We can make changes and at times we might need to. But this is our kind of our starting point for our application. And again, just like everything else, it's all JavaScript. Just a simple JSON file that we can use. Um, we'll get into some of this stuff later on using Connect and eventually Express. So we're not going to work on Express until week three or week four. So it's basically a framework that has common node functionality, sort of middleware, sits so underneath node. So code to launch a simple hello world in Express would look something like this. We won't get into the particulars of it, but this is kind of where we're going with week three, week four. And once we start using Express, we'll use it the rest of the term. We'll start with just node without Express for a week or two, and then we'll add Express in because our real world applications are going to not only use Node, we're going to use Express too. Okay. And you see objects that would be familiar, just like PHP objects, we have things like request, response. We also in PHP worked with objects like sessions, cookies, as you, as you can imagine, Express has those objects as well with similar types of functions. Sorry, didn't mean to shut that off. So those notes are here. I'm not a big believer in reading PowerPoint to you. You can read PowerPoints on your own. So that link is here. It's the mean stack featuring Node.js. That's a link. I just put this up. For some reason, Blackboard didn't want to upload the presentation. It may have been too large. It took forever. So I just stuck it on OneDrive in a shared, as a shared item. So this will just take you to OneDrive, and you can view that presentation or download it. Okay? And those slides will be available during the exams as well. So we've looked at MVC. One other article. Again, I'm just going to pull it up, but you can look at it on your own time. Here's a good article about Node. It also discusses some of the benefits of using Node. They've got some code samples. They talk about blocking and non-blocking. There's a few good screenshots here explaining these things, what package manager is. And then he also discusses in here some good examples of when you would want to use Node. So I think Tyler, you mentioned it earlier, something like chat, real-time communication. He also discusses some of the times when Node might not be appropriate. Okay. So here, server-side web application with a relational database. He's saying, I wouldn't bother with Node in this case. Could you use Node for a component in the server-side application with a relational database? Yep, you could. You could, so it, you might find if you have a particularly resource heavy or you're having issues with blocking, you could build a component 
with Node. You could build it as an API and let us your application just leverage that API, absolutely. Okay. So you can use Node with a relational database. I know Tom's done some projects and had some students, some programmer grads, do some work on some projects for Tom where they're using Node, Angular, and Express, but they're using a MySQL database because they the data was too complicated for Mongo. They wanted the, the, the traditional foreign keys, one-to-many relationships that a relational database offers. So it's still workable in that case. Give you a sample, actually. Here's a really good sample of a node application. Uh, node seller. So this is using MongoDB, Node Express. The only thing they're not using is Angular. They're using a different front end called backbone.js, but give you an idea. It's almost a single page application. Just basically simple create, read, update, and delete. So I can view a list, I can view an individual item. I can actually drag to change the picture, so that's using Backbone. Rather than having to do a file upload, I could do a drag and drop of a picture. And I can do create, read, update, and delete in here. If anybody wants to see, I can throw this link on Blackboard. And they've got all of their code on GitHub, so you can download the whole repository and see all the source code here, if you like. It's too bad they didn't use Angular for it, but this gives you an idea. So this is a really simple, what we call basically a single page application. Really doing create, read, update, and delete on a single table in one or two pages. So that's kind of an example. And for CSS styling, they used a Twitter Bootstrap, which we will include. I don't know if you guys have played around. Did you play around with Bootstrap at all in your web and internet fundamentals class? Or you just hand coded all the CSS? Some of you use Bootstrap a little bit. So it's basically a CSS framework. So pre-built style sheets where we can just leverage and use those existing classes. And it tends to be responsive. So on a mobile device, right? It automatically scales. We get a mobile friendly menu and everything fits on here at a mobile, mobile scale. So Bootstrap is great for this. So we're gonna have you guys use this. Okay, you don't really have to do your own CSS. May as well just leverage what's already here. Okay. So have a look. You can have a look at the full slide deck. I would definitely read through this article because it's going to give you some other background. And maybe they'll explain some extra things either in a way that makes more sense or gives you a little extra than what we've talked about so far. So we're going to do two other things. I said we wanted to touch on both of these. I want to talk about the cloud and then lastly we'll talk about GitHub very briefly and I'll give you your lab, which is using Git. Um, anybody use cloud hosting before, ever? A little bit? <laughs> you used Azure, which, Robert? Okay. So what, I mean, what is cloud hosting? What's the difference between the cloud and a traditional hosting environment? Jake? So like a cloud uh, hosting would be basically there's multiple servers hosting your website while uh, normal, like normal hosting would be there's like one specific server that's hosting your website. Okay. And cloud is sort of the direction more and more businesses and organizations are going. Why? What would be the benefits of the, some of the benefits of that? If the server, for example, with standard hosting, if your server goes down, uh, your website goes down, or say the data center experiences a power loss and like the UPS is break, like there's a lot of issues. Well, with cloud hosting, like you know, you can have like ten like servers go down, and your website will still probably be up. Yep. So you've got that redundancy. Why else? Scalability. Okay, can you explain? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, Ticketmaster, you get a surge of hits as soon as, you know, XYZ tickets go on sale. And then every other time of the, the year in between, it's okay, lol, lol, lol. So during those high performance periods, they up, up the amount of um, CPUs and RAMs and stuff, whole hosting the sites to, yep. to yeah. increase yeah. reliability. Yeah. A couple weeks ago, these <coughs> tickets went up like when they got priced, it was a $100 million per year. The first game extension, they were, they like went up five times. 
Yeah. Okay. So who are the big, right now there's a few, where, where can you get cloud services? I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay. So Azure, which is offered by, Microsoft. okay. So Microsoft <laughs> has Azure, which is available to you guys, which I'll show you in a minute. Amazon was kind of the originator of cloud services. They were the first ones really to offer cloud services. Who else offers cloud services? Sure Google's got one. Google does, yeah. They were a little, little bit late into the game, but yes, Google offers cloud hosting. Um, I think Squarespace. Yep. And I'll show you a few others. So what we want here, so in your intro to web, basically you had space in a sort of traditional PHP hosting environment where everybody had X amount of space. So what we're going to do in this class is make sure that all of your stuff, anything you submit to us, is in the cloud. Okay. So this is a slide deck from Microsoft. There are just a few things on point out about cloud hosting in general. Okay. One of the things is that employers have told us that definitely they want they're moving, they've already, many of them already moved to the cloud, so they want you guys to be familiar with how cloud hosting works. Okay. So certainly speed is a consideration. Scalability is a huge one. Okay. So we can scale for peak demand, for busy times, low times. Okay. Also in terms of money, we're basically paying per use. So in a traditional hosting environment, we're basically paying a flat rate per month, regardless of use. Okay. And if we came up against our cap, if we had suddenly more users and needed more storage, then we paid for, well, then we had a problem. We quickly had to move that site and move it to another server, right? Move from a shared to a dedicated or semi-dedicated server. Or maybe we needed two mirrored servers. When we're using cloud, that scalability happens automatically. Think of this scenario. Right? How many servers, if you were going to run a web application to host the Olympic Games, how many servers do you suppose you might need for that? Depends on how many years. That's right. Good point. What if it's during the games? Probably a lot more than not. Yeah, probably dozens or hundreds. Another good example would be that it's fault tolerant. So they've designed it without knowing that it might fail. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And many businesses, many sites, they're, they're seasonal. Okay? One of my clients who was an online retailer, and we figured one year that 85% of his business was done between November 1st and December 15th. The other, you know, eight and a half months, sorry, 10 and a half months a year, he only did 15% of his business. 85% of his sales were that. So something like this solution would be great for him because his, his site slowed down most times. Okay. So typically it would look something like this, right? Most businesses needs aren't like this. Even here at the college, we think about at the college, many of our programs don't run in summer. Either people aren't here, they're on co-op, so the load on things like Blackboard is much less in summer than it is, for example, now. So using the cloud, we're going to see these kinds of spikes. Spikes and then declines. So it's not only hosting. We also have access to a whole suite of other things, like virtual machines. I know the networking classes are using cloud hosting so that they can give students access in the cloud through virtual machines, different operating systems, so they can learn how to administer a Linux server, a Windows 10 server, a Windows 8 server, a 7 Mac OS. Right? They've got access to all these things through the cloud. We've got other applications, networking, storage. So Robert, you mentioned OneDrive. I mean, it also comes with storage. Right? I just, IT issued me a new machine not last week. I was up and running in five minutes because I don't have any data to back up. I keep all my data in OneDrive and in Dropbox and on Google Drive, those are all cloud storage. So all I need to do to get my data back is get a new machine, log in, put in my credentials, download the OneDrive and Dropbox client, all my data's there, right? I'm not gonna worry if this machine blows up, doesn't matter, all my data is already stored in the cloud, offline. So it's a whole bunch of other services in addition to hosting. So we can do VMs. Typically, we've got a management portal to handle these things, and we can run different types of servers if we want. It also typically comes with a whole bunch of whatever hosting, cloud hosting we pick, typically comes with access to a whole bunch of online services that we can leverage and we can access. 
So things like different databases, different server products, et cetera. So these are some of the things Microsoft offers through Azure, but if we were to go to Google, we were to go to Amazon, we were to go to Heroku, we're gonna find similar types of offerings that are available. Okay. We won't go through that. So Azure also offers things like mobile services right here. Cloud-based syncing, et cetera. And just because Azure's owned by Microsoft doesn't mean they only support ASP.NET. We can run anything. I just installed a WordPress site on an Azure hosting plan. It was like two clicks. Here you go, you want an application, WordPress, boom, pick a domain, it's done. Took about three clicks and about 10 seconds. So we want to run Node on Azure, we can do it. We want to run MongoDB, we want to run Java. We've got full access to do all these things. Okay. Some of the other, many of the other cloud services also tie in with source control tools like Git, GitHub, Bitbucket, Dropbox, FTP. We've got full access to all these things. We'll talk about them a bit more another day. Okay. So the way pricing works, it's basically instances so if we need one instance, it's actually free. We need more server instances, we can scale it up. So our pricing will depend on use. So we can even set up for auto scaling. If we think we're gonna see spikes in traffic, we can let the cloud provider automatically scale. We also may notice that we have busy times. So we can scale up during busy times and scale back during slow times to keep our costs down, but keep our performance at a high level in high demand times. So some of the examples, some of the options that are available to us. So min and max size and how many CPUs do we want? And this will check every five minutes. What do we need? So every once every two hours, it'll remove instances of a CPU if we don't need them. So lots of stuff on here. Can you go back to the station? Yep. So basically, we should always have a staging site. We don't want to just work on a developed machine and push it to the internet live. We need a staging site, you know, so it should be dev.mydomain.com. We might password protect that. Our clients can see and check our changes, check our updates before we push things live. Right? So we go from our production machine to staging. We test it on staging. We get our clients okay, and then we migrate over to a live application. And it supports this kind of uh, benefit. Now, where can you guys get cloud hosting? Well, some of it you can actually get through us. I'm going to give you a bunch of options. Okay. Here's the first one. Get it from Microsoft. You all have DreamSpark accounts. If you go to dreamspark.com and click the cloud is for you, no cost for students. So you just click on get Azure now. You sign in with your DreamSpark account. If you don't remember your password, you can read, there's a reset password link. If you still can't get in, if you email Greg, our computer studies technician, that's cstech at georgiancollege.ca. You can ask him to reset your DreamSpark account, and it will, he'll re, he can reset your password, which will email you a link. So you can use Azure. Azure supports the full mean stack, so we can run Node.js apps and host them on Azure. So that's an option. So it runs all of these things. You can build WordPress, PHP, MySQL, Java. You can do all these things. So you guys already have access to this. No cost to you. The other place you can get, well, I'll show you a couple other options. 
Another big cloud service that runs Node.js is called Heroku. We may play around with this another day. And again, they have a free basic plan, and for the amount of use we're going to be doing, you're not going to be charged. You can sign up, you don't, even have, you don't have to provide a credit card, so you won't be charged. Okay? So we can run Node.js apps here. You can create an account for free. We may play around with this later. The other thing you can do that I'm going to encourage you all to do, we're going to talk about GitHub in a minute. GitHub has a student developer pack, which I'm going to encourage all of you to sign up for. Anybody signed up for this before? Okay. Here's what you get. Okay. Bitnami is another big cloud host. You get three months of hosting on a business plan, normally 50 bucks of $49 a month. So they're giving you three months for free. So that's $150 value. Okay. You also get $100 credit at DigitalOcean, which is also another cloud platform. All of these will support Node.js. Okay. You get DNS management. We'll come back to GitHub in a minute. Visual Studio, well, you guys already have DreamSpark accounts. You can get Visual Studio. You get, from Namecheap, they give you one free domain name for a year. They also give you a free SSL certificate. One of the things employers have told us is not only do they want to see student portfolios, they said, we really don't want to see the portfolios running on the Web Design 4 server. Right? We want to see dzoo.ca, and your portfolio should be running there. Well, here's a free domain name for a year for you. They want to know that you know how to register a domain name, get it online, point the DNS, and upload your site there. We heard that repeatedly from employers. So here you go, a free domain name for you. <laughs> you want to install an SSL certificate on it too? Go ahead. They're giving it to you for free. You have SendGrid, which is used for sending emails. So this actually allows you to send up to 15,000 free emails a month. So if you want to build a newsletter feature, where do I get a mail server without paying for hosting plan to send email? From SendGrid. Stripe does credit card processing. And in fact, they have a cool API that's really easy to integrate payment authorization into Node.js. Um, and here's a tool for those of you who want to play around with game development, the Unreal Engine. You get that as well as a student. Now, I think if you sign up for this, your account's not active right away. I think they'll send you a verification, and it takes a little while to get access to all of this. But I would encourage all of you. It's a lot of free stuff. Like, there's a lot of value here. You may not use all of these things, but it also gives you a chance. There's at least there's the two cloud services. There's DigitalOcean as well as Bitnami, so you're getting free access to both by signing up for this. Emma? Okay, okay. Good to know. Thank you. Kyle? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I presume when you sign up, when you sign up there. But I don't know the answer to that. So basically you've got access to four different cloud providers. Heroku's free. You get Bitnami and DigitalOcean if you get the GitHub Student Developer Pack. You get Azure through DreamSpark. So we don't really care which host you use. You use whichever one you like. One of the other cool things about Azure we're going to have you create a GitHub account and put all your code on GitHub. Azure actually lets you deploy straight from GitHub. So rather than having to use FTP to deploy your applications to Azure, you can set it up, tie your Azure hosting account to a GitHub repository, and every time you upload new code to GitHub, it automatically is deployed to Azure. Or you can do it as a manual process. So we'll show you how to do that as well. How many of you in here, who has a GitHub account already? Okay. You're all going to have one before you walk out of this room. <laughs> so we should probably talk about why. What is GitHub? What's it used for? It's like an online link to all your code. Yeah, so it's an online code repository. Why would we want to force you guys to use it? Okay, that's one thing. Employers are telling us you need to know it. Like 
Absolutely. Okay. So you're right. Kenzie? I can say that distributed version control is just how things are done now. So you need to know. This is the industry standard. Okay, so here's a sample application. Jarrett and I have been building this out together over several months. So you can see a couple things here. First, the first one is we can both push code updates here. It's an online repository. Rather, him having a local copy and me having a separate copy. Okay, we both can sync. So if I'm working and Jarrett makes updates, I can just pull his updates from GitHub and work on them. Okay, if we both edit the same file and make changes, GitHub will show us those discrepancies. It also, notice it says 46 commits. So every time we publish a new update, they're here. So if we want to go back, if I break something, I can go back to a previous version and all my code is archived online. So not only can we use it as a collaboration tool, we're using it as version control. Normally, as soon as we save updates, unless we've made a copy of that code, our old code is gone. And it's a frequent problem. We have something working, we add a new feature, or we try to fix something, and then we break something else that used to work, right? We didn't realize how our code might cascade. So this is an online repository where we have access to all of those older versions, so we can go and pull them back. Okay? Employers have told us again and again that students need to use GitHub. Basically, we were told employers wanted to see three things when a student applies for a job. They want to see your portfolio, preferably running under your own domain name. That's why your first assignment in this class is going to be to use Node and Express to build a portfolio. Okay? So that'll be assignment one, which we'll give you in a few weeks. So they want to see your portfolio, they want to see your LinkedIn page, and they want to see your GitHub page. They want to be able to see your code and look at your code style. Does it look professional? Is it documented? Is your code organized? Okay, so this is what employers want to see. So we're going to force you guys. Whenever you're given an assignment, your code is going to get posted to GitHub, and then your application is going to get published somewhere in the cloud. So all you have to do to submit everything is give us a link to your GitHub repository and give us a link where we can click and run the application in the cloud. You won't have to zip and upload to Blackboard anymore. Just give us the Git link and give us the link to your application. So we're also going to use it, any code we do in class, rather than me, like an intro to web, at the end of every class I would zip and upload a zip file to Blackboard. We're just going to put all the lessons here. So I'll give you my GitHub link. So all of my lessons now for every course, they just go here. I'll give you the you know comp 2068 lesson two and I'll put in a description of what it is you know introduction to JavaScript I'll put the links in each week on github but anything you need to find just go to my github page and get it okay now I'm going to encourage you to have two accounts here's why I want you to get the student account which takes a while to, to get the student account gives you five by default with github is free but all of your repositories are public, so anybody can access them. Stuff we're doing each week is no big deal, or the labs, which are small. For your big assignments, um, you're probably going to want that code to be private. <laughs> you put it on GitHub, it's public. When you create a student account, you get five repositories that are private for free. Normally, they charge you for that, for private repositories, but students get five free ones. Yeah, you could also delete, once I've marked it, you could delete it and put another one up there. So what I suggest is I'm going to want you to have a GitHub account for today, but I also want you to have a student account, but the student account's not going to be active right away. So you might need to create two. Okay. So we're going to be using, everybody's going to get comfortable with GitHub. So there is a GitHub client. I put the link on Blackboard. You'll want to download it. There's two ways to upload your code to GitHub or download your code. You can use the command line if you want. But here's the link to the desktop client. If you want the desktop client, it's a small download. And it looks like this. Okay. 
so it will link to your to, to any code repositories online and you can either download a local copy of the code or if you make changes you can upload or push those changes to github which is how you would collaborate with somebody else so here's what I want you to do I'm going to give you lab one lab one is pretty simple and when you're done lab one you're free to go this won't take long so here's what I want you to do for lab one if you already have a github account you can skip, skip the first step if you don't have a github account I want you to go ahead and create one don't create the student account yet you can do that on your own time because it's going to take a while Okay, great. Okay, that's great. Okay, so if you just go to github.com, there's a sign up link. All you need is a username, password, and your email. That's it. Your account will get created right away. So just let me go through the instructions. Once you've created an account, I want you to create a new repository. There's a link in the header for new repository. Create a repository called Lab One. And make sure you choose the option to create a README file. Just a simple text file that GitHub will put in your repository. Once you've done that, I want you to edit the README file so that it says, this is my lab one. And the instructions are here in this article. Here is a link on how to create a repository. So once you've signed up, they walk you through, here's how to create a repository and change the readme file. Basically all I want you to do are in these instructions. Once you've created the repository with the readme file and you've changed the text in the readme file, all you need to do to submit your lab is go to your repository, like this one, copy the URL from the browser, paste it into Blackboard. So click on lab one and submit the URL all I'm gonna do is click on your link and check your repository to see you created a lab one repository with a readme file where you've changed the content that's it okay. this will take five minutes and once you submitted the lab you're free to go if you already have a github account you don't have to create a new one you can do this within your existing github account just make the readme file say this is my lab one. Save the changes and upload, put the link on Blackboard. That's it. <coughs> we'll look at pushing changes from the command line and from the Git client a bit later. Today we'll just do it right on GitHub's website. <coughs>